Chapter 14 of The Castle of Twilight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sunny. The Castle of Twilight by Margaret Horton Porter. Chapter 14. Eleanor. When Laurie, her message given, started back upstairs again, Alex was at her side. At Lenore's door, they both stopped till Madame opened it. Laurie entered the room at once, but Eleanor shook her head at the maiden and bade her seek her rest. Then Alex, disappointed, but too weary for speech, Follow the chattering demoiselles down the corridor. Where were all the rooms, and, saying not a word to one of them, shut herself into her own chamber. Once there, she disrobed with speed, but when she had crept into her bed and pulled the coverings up above her, she found that sleep was an impossibility. There was a dual weight at her heart which for the moment she could not analyze. It was as if some great misfortune had befallen her. Yet Lenoir lived, was remarkably well, and the child, ah, the child! It was the first, almost, that Alex had thought of the child, a girl, another girl, in Lu school, a thing of inaction, of resignation, of quiescence, the sort of fate, the gist of age. Alas, alas, a girl to grow up alone, here in this wilderness, companionless, without hope of escape. Thus, do inarticulately, everyone in Lukupu school was meditating with Alex, till at last, one by one, they fell asleep, each in his late bed. The morning was far spent, and an April sun steamed brightly across her coverlet, with Alex finally woke. Her sleep had done her good, and there was no trace of melancholy in her air as she rose, and made herself ready for the day. She was healthfully hungry, but there was another interest, greater than hunger, that has caused her so speedily to dress. Hurrying out and down the hall, she stopped at the door of Lenoir's room and tapped there softly. Laurie opened it at once and smiled a good morning to her. Come down in, she whispered. Lenoir would have thee see the child. Alex entered softly and halted near the bed, transfixed by the sight of Lenoir. Never, even in the early days of her bridal, had Gerald's lady been so beautiful. The mysterious spells of her holy estate was on her, was clearly visible in her brilliant eyes, in the rosy flush of her cheeks, in the coyly burning gold of her wondrous hair, in the smiling, gentle wonder of her manner, there was something newly born in her, some still ecstasy that had come to her together with the tiny bundle at her side. Come, though, Alex, and look at her, she said in a weak voice, smiling happily and casting tender love looks at the little thing. Alex went over and, with Laurie's aid, unwrapped enough of the small creature for her to see its tiny red face and feeble, fluttering hands. As she gently touched one of the cheeks, the wide, blue baby eyes stared up at her, unwinking in their new wonder at the world, while Lenoir watched them eagerly, hungrily. Neither she nor Alex noticed that Laurie had moved off to a distance and was staring duly out of a window. 
when Alex had stood for some moments over the baby, wondering in her heart what to say to Lenore, the mother looked up at her with those newly unfathomable eyes and said softly, Put her into my arms, Alex. Alex did so, laying the infant carefully across the mother's breast. Lenore's arms closed around it, and her eyes fell shut, while a smile of unutterable peace lighted up her gentle face. Alex knew that it was time for her to go, and moved as she had never been moved before in her young life. She started toward the door, glancing as she went at Laurie, who followed her. How beautiful she is, whispered Alex as they stood together on the threshold. Laurie nodded, but there was no sign of joy in her face. Alas for them both, she said quietly. There have been enough daughters in Lucopon school. To this, Alex could find no reply, and so, with a slight note, she left the room and went down to the morning meal. Madame Eleanor was not there. After the strain of the past night, she had gone to her room with a little after sunrise, leaving Laurie to care for the young mother. At breakfast, then, Courtois and Alex sat nearest the head of the table. But they did not talk together. In fact, no one said very much during the course of the meal. Instead of the joyful gaiety that might have been expected, now that the dead lord's lady was safely through the her child, a dual gloom seemed to overhang everything, to weigh very one down. Courtois ate in silence, heavy browned and brooding. His head bent far over. David, in no humor for weight, scarcely spoke. Even Alex, whose heart had been somewhat lightened by the light of Lenoir and her happiness, presently succumbed to the atmosphere and began to reflect that the last hope of the castle was gone, that the line of Kupusko had died forever. And neither she nor anyone else paused to think that if the little twilight baby asleep upstairs had understood the true nature of her welcome into the world, she might readily have been persuaded to escape again as rapidly as possible into her blue ether where pain and unwelcome were things unknown. When Alex had eaten, she returned to the sick room and, Madame being still asleep, insisted upon taking Laurie's place, place till the weary girl had eaten and slept. Lenoir had already taken some nourishment, and the baby had been fed, and, while the noon sunshine poured a flood of gold over the world, the mother and child drowsed happily together in their bed. Alex, having set the room as much to rights as was possible, seated herself by one of the open windows, and straight away began to dream. Her thoughts were of her own life, of the new life that she should now soon enter upon, and of what would be for her when she should really reach the vast world that lay behind the barrier of eastern hills. That world that Laurie had found, but could not say. That world from which Lenoir had come, and whither Garrod had betaken himself to die. Alex mused for a long time, and, in her untaught way, philosophized over the sad stories of those in the castle, and the prospect of the real history that were might be for her when she could leave Le Coupuscour, and it was in the midst of this reverie that the door from Laurie's room opened softly, and Madame came in.
Near the threshold, she paused, looking intently at the sleeping mother and child, so that she did not at first perceive Alex, who sat motionless, transfixed by the change which, since yesterday, had become upon Madame. If there were gloom through the castle, because of the disappointment in the sex of Lenoir's child, that gloom was epitomized in the face of Madame Eleanor. She was paler and older than Alex had ever seen her before. The white in her hair was more marked than the dark. Every line in her face had deepened. Her eyes, tearless as they were, seemed somehow faded, and her manner bespoke bespoke an unutterable weariness. She looked haggard and old and worn. And yet, as she gazed at unconscious picture of youth and tender love, the joy of the world and the life of her race asleep there before her, her face softened and her mouth lost a little of its hardness. After some moments of this gazing, seeing that still she had not moved, Alex went to her. Laurie was weary, madam, and so I took her place while Lenoir and the baby slept, she said. Eleanor nodded, and Alex wondered uneasily if she could leave the room. After a second or two, however, madam shook away her preoccupation and turned to the girl. Alex, she said, none hath as yet been dispatched for Monsieur Neuf de Saint Nazaire, and I will not have Aunt Solomon baptize the child. Go thou and tell Courtois to ride and fetch the bishop as soon as may be. We perform one last ceremony for this house. Give him my good greeting. Tell him. The noise well, and the babe, a girl, mon Dieu, a girl, has three, Alex, and though it is not return, I will sit here while Lenoir sleeps. Alex bowed, but still stood hesitating, near the door, till Madame looked up at her impatiently. When I have given Cotroix his message, let me bring thee food and wine, madam, though it'll be ill, and though it out. Nay, begone, Alex, bring nothing to me. Why should I eat? Why should I eat when after me there will be none of mine to eat in Cripple's cool? And it was with a kind of groan that madam moved slowly across the bedside. When Alex left the room, she was still standing there gazing down upon Lenoir, who, if awake, could hardly have borne the look with which the madam regarded her. An hour later, Courtois was on his way to saint but he did not return with Monseigneur. Till even son of the next day, arrived at the castle, the bishop was given chance for food and rest after his side, before he was summoned to Lena's room, where Madame received him. From Courtois, on their way, Saint Nazaire had learned of the disappointment of the castle, so that he was prepared for what he found. He read Eleanor's mind from her face, and was not surprised at it, but from his own manner, no one could have told that he felt anything but the utmost delight with the whole affair. He was full of congratulations and facilitations of every kind. He was witty, he was gay, he was more talkative than anyone had ever seen him before. And he took the baby and handled it, cried to it, cooed to it, with the air of an experienced old building. Lenore, still radiant with her happiness of motherhood, brightened yet more under the chair of his presence, 
and in her unexpected joy of the bishop found some consolation for the cloud of misery that shrouded madame indeed he watched lenore with unaffected delight seeing with amazement the miracle that had been worked in her and knowing her now for the first time as what he had been before her marriage when there was in her nature none of the melancholy the morbidness the pain of loneliness that had for so long clouded her life lenoir was not strong enough to endure even his cheerful presence very long and when laurie presently stole in he seized the opportunity that he had been waiting for and on some light excuse drew madame with him out of the room the moment that they were alone together his gay manner dropped from him like a cloak, and she looked upon the woman before him with piercing eyes. Eleanor, he said severely, it were well and thou came with me for a little time before God. There is written on thy face the tale of that old time inward rebellion that hath been so long asleep that I had hoped it dead. Madame looked at him with something of defiance, his pleasure very plainly to be read in her brilliant eyes. My lord, she said coldly, thou art weird with thy right, it were well and thou throwst rest. I have already rested, where wouldn't thou rather be, in thy own room, or in the chapel? Charles! Madame spoke with angry impetuosity. Think you I am to be treated as a child? There are times when all of us are children, Eleanor. Times when we need the father hand, the father guidance. I would not be harsh with thee were there another way. Nevertheless, thou must do my bidding. She led him in silence to her own room and they entered it together, saint Nazaire closing the door behind him. Madame seated herself at once in the broad chair near the window, and the bishop paced up and down before her. The room was warm, for the night air was soft, and a half-dead fire gleamed upon the stone hearth. A torch upon the wall had been lighted, and two candles burned on the table nearby. By this light, Sinazir could watch Eleanor's face as he walked. It was some moments before he spoke, and when he began, his voice had changed again, and was as gentle as a woman's. This birth of a girl child hath been a grievous disappointment to thee, dear friend. Eleanor replied only by a look, but what words could have expressed half so much? Art thou angry with me, Eleanor? Am I to be blamed for it? Is there fault in any one for what is come? Sex is no matter of choice with the world. Were it so, methinks thou hast not now been grieving. Thou sayest truly, it is no matter of choice with the world. But has not ever told that there is one who may choose always as he will? There is a fault, and it is the fault of God. God of God, Charles, have I not had enough to bear? Could I not, now that the end cannot be far away, have no a little content in my old age? What has there been for me, this Thirty years, save sorrow, with the death of Geralt, I believe that the world held no further work for me, but in the following month's hope, which I had through forever gone, came on me again, come back its coming as I would. Yet the thought that an earl might be born to cripple's core, the thought that the line might yet be carried on to something better than this eternal sadness, came to be so strong with me that i gave away for that i was to joy and now 
by the merciless wrath of God, fate makes sport of me again. God alone would have been so pitiless, and am I, a mortal, to forgive the Almighty for all the woe that He recklessly puts on me? In that speech, Eleanor's low voice had risen above its usual pitch, and rang out in tones of deep-seated, passionate anger. Then Nazir paused in his walk to look at her. As she spoke, and never had he felt himself in a more difficult position. Sincere as was his belief, there were indeed things in the divine order that his creed could not explain away. He dreaded to take the only orthodox stand, resignation and continued praise of the Lord, for in Eleanor's present state of mind, this would be worse than a mockery, and yet. In this, he was obliged at length to take his refuge. Eleanor, when Laurie, the infant, was first put into thy arms, was thou、so、grieved that she was not a man child? I had Gerald, had thou not loved Laurie and cared for her through thy life, because she was thy child, flesh of thy flesh, blood of thy blood, conceived of great love. And born of suffering, yeah, fairly, and despite her months of grievous wandering from thy side, still hath he not given thee all the joy that Gerald gave. More, methinks, in that she hath ever been more my own than Eleanor. And there was joy in the man's tone. Take this child of thy son to thy heart and love her. Let her young innocence bring thee peace. Hold her close to thy life, and give and receive comfort through thy love. Seek not O, because she is not what she cannot be. Assume not a knowledge greater than that of God. Trouble not thyself about the future, but rather take what is given thee. And know that it is good. Shall not a young voice cause these walls to echo again to the sound of laughter? Will not a child bring light into thy life? Why should thou grieve because, in years after thy death, the coupon's cour may fall into other hands than those of thy race? Think that thou the wilt be here to see it? For shame, Eleanor! Forget thy bitterness, and find the joy that Gerald's widow already knows. Though she would not have acknowledged it, Eleanor was influenced by Bishop's words, and the change in her was already visible in her face. Judging wisely, then, Saint Nazaire left his place rest where it was, and blessing her, said good night and left her to sleep or to pray. He could not tell which. And in truth, Eleanor slept. But in her sleep, love and pity entered into her heart. She woke in the early dawn, and, hardly thinking what she did, stole into Lenore's room, creeping softly to the bed where the sleeping mother and infant lay. At sight of them, a wave of feeling overswept her. She knew again the crowning joy of woman's life. She felt again the glory of youth, and when she returned to her solitude, it was to sweep away the greater part of the bitterness, and to take into her inmost heart the helpless baby of Gerald. On the following morning, in the presence of an imposing company, the Lord Bishop officiating, the little girl was baptized. Lori and Courtois were the godparents. Lori, feeling that in being trusted with this holy office, she stood once more honorably in the eyes of the world. According to her mother's wish, the babe was christened Lenoir, and Alex guessed wrong when she thought the little one called after another of that name. When the ceremony was over. The baptismal feast lay ready spread, 
Madam took the child into her arms and carried it back to the mother. And Saint Nazaire, seeing the kiss that she pressed upon the tiny cheek, realized that the cause was won. Madame Eleanor's lead was quickly followed by everyone in the castle, and the disappointment at the baby sex wore away so rapidly that in a month probably no one would have admitted that it had ever been any chagrin at all. Perhaps no royal heir had ever known more abject homage than was paid to that wee, bright-eyed, grey-faced. Helpless creature who was perfectly contented only when she lay in her mother's arm. Lenore regained her strength slowly. Her long winter of idleness and grieving had ill-fitted her to bear the strain of what she had endured, and it was many weeks before she tried to leave her room. Thus, bit by bit, the whole life of the castle. Came to gravitate around her chamber. It was like a cord of which the young mother was queen, and where at certain hours of the day, all the woman folk of Quiponscour were wont to congregate. It was on an afternoon in the middle of May, when summer first hovered over the land, that Lenore was dressed for the first time. She sat in a semi-reclined position by the window, when she could look off upon the sea, the baby at her side, and Alex, the only other person in the room. For nearly an hour, Lenore had been silent, one hand gently caressing the baby's little cheek, her big eyes wandering along the far horizon line. Alex was bent over. A parchment manuscript, which Anselm had taught her how to read, and she scarcely raised her eyes from it to look at anything in the room. Her passage had become complicated, and at the same time interesting. When Lenore's voice suddenly broke in upon her, "Alex, it's long time now since I saw Cotwas." Think as though he snare and would come and talk to me. Alex let her poetry go and jumped hastily up. I will seek him, and he be about the castle. He will surely come. Lena smiled with pleasure. Thank thee, maiden. Let him come now, at once. Alex, hugging Cotwas's secret to her heart, hurriedly left the room. And ran downstairs, straight upon Cotwas, who stood in the hall below. He was booted and spurred, and his horse waited for him in the doorway, making a hasty apology to Alex. He was going on when he cried to him, "Cotwas, stay!" Madame Lenoir seeks thy presence. She would have thee go to her and talk with her for an hour this afternoon. Shall I tell her those written hawking? Holy Mary, say that, say that I come instantly. She hath asked for me. Hurry, Alex, say that I come at once. Contois retreated to his room, trembling like a girl. He had forgotten his horse, which Alex considerably caused to be taken back to the stable. And while he removed his spurs and forcibly rearranged his dress and hair, he tried in vain to recover his equanimity. Then, when he could no longer torture himself with delay, he hurried away to the door of her room and there paused again, remembering how many times since her illness he had stood there, both by night and by day, listening not always vainly. For the sound of her voice, or for the little wailing cry of the hungry babe, and now, now he was to enter that sacred room, holier to him than any consecrated church of God. Now he was to look at her, to touch her hand, to fix his eyes upon her exquisite face. He drew a long breath, 
and was about to tap on the door when it suddenly opened, and Alex, finding herself face to face with him, gave a little exclamation. Holy saints! I was just coming to seek thee again. Has he forgotten that Madame waits for thee there? Come in. Controis never noticed the mischief of Alex's tone, but went straight into the room and saw Lenore sitting by the window with the baby on her lap. She turned toward him, smiling and holding out her hand. He went over, looking at her thirstily, but not so that. She could read what was in his heart. Then he realized vaguely that Alex had left the room, and that he was alone with Nenor. He's very long, Controis, very long, since we have seen each other. Why hast thou not come now, madam? Had I put through though this have had me? Thrice every day during my illness came I to thy door to ask after thee and the babe, and since then, often I have stood and listened to hear if thou wast speaking here within, but I did not know. Enough, Controis. I thank thee. Thou's very good. Thou knowest those all that I have left to Geralt. And I could fain have thee often near me. Wilt take the babe, little one? She feels the strength of a man's arms, but seldom sit there younger with her. So she put the tiny bundle into his strong arms and laughed to see the half-terrified air with which the young fellow bore it over to the settle which he indicated. But when he had sat down, he laid the baby on his knees, and then, retaining careful hold of it, turned his whole look upon Lenore. She smiled at him, supremely unconscious of the electric thrills that were making the man's holy body quiver and tremble with emotion. Indeed, it would have been difficult enough to read his feelings in his smile. Of the fact manner, for a long time they sat there talking upon many subjects, but most of all about Gerald, whose name had scarcely crossed Lenore's lips since the time of his death. To Controis, it was an acute pain to hear her refer to the various incidents of her courtship in Rennes. What lack of her words! There was no suggestion of either grief or bitterness. She recalled her first acquaintance with Gerald fully, incident by incident, and caused the Contois to take an unwilling part in the reminiscences. He hoped continually to get her away from the subject, to matters how nearer both of them. But time sped on, and as the sun began to near the sea. The baby woke from sleep with a little cry that Contois recognized with a pang. His hour was over, and he had gained little hope from it. Yet, as he returned the baby to its mother's arms, there was a smile for him in Lena's calm eyes, and he retreated with a beating heart as Madame Eleanor and Laurie came together into the room. To spend their usual evening hour with the mother and the child. This hour of the day, the twilight time, the time of yearning for things long gone, had of late weeks been drawing these three women from the twilight castle very close together. Flory, Lenoir, and Eleanor. These three. With Alex, oft times a shadow in the background, were accustomed to sit together, watching the sunset die over the great waters, and waiting for the appearance of the evening star upon the fading glow. And in this time of silent companionship, each felt within her new growth, and a new half sorrowful love for the life in this lonely habitation. The spell of solitude 
was weaving about them a slow, strong bond, which in after years none of these three felt any wish to break. Many dream shadows, the ghosts of forgotten lives, rose up for each of the darkening waves of the sea, and with these spirits of memory or imagination, each one was making a life as real and as strong as the lives of those that dwelt out in the great world, for which, at one time or another, all of them had so deeply yearned. Each felt in her heart that her active life was over, and as time passed. And thoughts began adequately to take the place of realities. None of them cared to keep alive the sharp stings of bitterness or of unavailing regret. They knew themselves dead to the great outer life that each, in her way, had known. Nor did they mourn themselves. What fire of life remained? With them had been transformed into sacred dreams and ambitions for the future of that little creature swept so carefully from the world. Now lying peacefully asleep upon the mother breast of Geralt's widow. End of chapter fourteen. Recording by Sunny. Chapter Fifteen of the Castle of Twilight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Courtney Miller. The Castle of Twilight by Margaret Horton Potter. Chapter Fifteen: The Rising Tide. Summer was on the world again, and with its coming, melancholy was banished for a season from the crepuscule. With the first northward flight of storks. A new air, a breath of hidden life and gaiety, crept into the castle household, and in the early days of June broke forth in a riot of pleasures, carols, garland weaving parties, and hunting. As in former times, Laura was now the moving spirit in every sport, and to the general amazement, Madame, who in her younger days had been celebrated at the chase, herself headed one of the rabbit hunts, in that day a favorite pastime with women. The country around the crepuscule was as beautiful in summer as it was desolate in winter, for the moorlands were one gay tangle of many-colored wildflowers. The cultivated land around the peasants' homes was thick with various crops, and the cool green depths of the forest hid beauties surpassing all those of the open country. The stables of the crepuscule were well supplied with horses, for the family, both women and men, had always been persistent riders. In these June days, the women folk. Madame and Laura and the demoiselles rode early and late, deserting wheel, loom, and tambour frame to revel in a much-needed rest and change of occupation. Only Lenore refused to take part in the sports, finding pleasure enough at home with the child, who was growing to be a fine, lusty infant with a smile as ready as if she had been born in Wren. And the mother and child were happy enough to sit all day in the flower-strewn meadow between the north wall and the dry moat, playing together with bright posies. Watching the movements of the birds in the open falconry, and sometimes taking part in quieter revels with the others, ere June was gone, the demoiselles were scarcely to be recognized for the pale, heavy-eyed, pallid things that had been wont to assemble in the great hall after supper on winter evenings to listen to the stories told round the fire. Now their laughter was ever ready, their feet light for the dance, their cheeks brown, and their eyes bright with a continual riot in sunlight and sea winds. Winter lay behind. Like the shadow of an ugly dream, and now of a sudden, God's world, and with it La Crepuscule, became beautiful for man. In the first week of July, however, the period of gaiety was checked by the loss of four members of the household. Two of the demoiselles of noble family, whom Madame had taken to train as gentlewomen of rank, Bert de Montfort and Isabelle de Joinville, had now been in La Crepuscule the customary time for the acquirement of etiquette and the arts of needlework. And escorts arrived from their homes to convoy them away. After their departure, the squires Louis of Florence and Robert Milot resigned their places and rode out into the world to seek a life of action. There were now left in Le Crepuscule the demoiselles whom Lenore had brought with her from Rennes a year ago, and two others who had come to Madame many years ago, 
and who must perforce stay on, having no other home than this, living as they did upon Madame's bounty. And there were also two young squires, who had sworn fealty to Madame, but hoped some day to ride to Rennes, and win their spurs in the lists of their Lord Duke. For the present they were content to remain out on the lonely coast, where Courtois taught them the articles of knighthood, and where twenty stout henchmen could look up to them as superiors. These were the David Le Petit, Anselm the Steward, Alix, Courtois, and a young peasant woman, who had come to foster the infant of Madame Lenore, comprised the attendance of the three ladies of Crepuscule. It was a well-knit little company, and one so accustomed to the quiet life, that none of them, save only one, desired better things. Of the mood of Alix during these summer months, much might be said. Throughout the spring she had been in a state of hot desire for what was not in Le Crepuscule. She was filled with unrest, but her plans were too vague, too indefinite, for immediate action. Strong as was the will that would have carried her through any difficulty that lay not in the condition of her heart, she was still, after nearly six months of dreaming and debating, in Le Crepuscule. Still she labored through the long, dull mornings, and still, through the afternoons, she drifted about through moving seas of doubt and yearning. She longed for the world, but she could not give up Le Crepuscule and those whom it held. Here was her problem. Which way to turn? She felt that another such winter as she had just passed would drive her senses from her, but she knew that anywhere outside the crepuscule, the visions of three faces, the fair, sad faces of her ladies, would haunt her by day and by night till she should return to them at last. She carried her struggle always with her, and at length it drove her to seek an old-time solitude. She began to spend her afternoons in a cave in a great cliff north of that on which the castle stood. This cave had been formed by the action of the water, and it stretched in cavernous darkness far into the wall of rock, much farther than Alix had ever dared to go. Near the entrance, four or five feet above the tide-washed floor, was a little ledge where she was accustomed to sit till the rising water drove her to the upper shore. Tides, in Brittany, are proverbially high, and at full tide the top of the cave's opening was scarcely visible above the water. So it behooved Alix to restrain herself from sleep while she lay therein, meditating on her other life. On the 19th of July, the tide was at low ebb at half-past two in the afternoon, and at three o'clock Alix entered the cave and climbed, dry-shod, up to her ledge of rock. Here, as she knew, she was safe for two hours, if she chose to stay so long. The interior of this cave was by no means an uninteresting place, though Alix had never yet explored it beyond the space of twenty feet, where it was bright with the daylight that poured in through its jagged entrance. After that it wound a darker way into the cliff, and the far recesses were lost in utter blackness. A spoken word directed toward the inner passageway would reverberate along that mysterious interior till one could not but be a little awed at the vast extent of the lost passage. The visible floor of the cavern was a thing of interest and beauty, for at low tide it was like a little park, where pools of clear seawater alternated with groves of filmy plants, small ridges of pebbles and rocks and patches of delicately ribbed sand, where every species of shellfish dwelt. At times Alix spent hours in studying sea life in these places, and certainly, on hot summer afternoons, no pleasanter occupation could have been found. Probably others than Alix would have taken to it, were it not for the fact that the cave was the scene of one of the weirdest legends of the coast, and was held in avoidance as much by castle folk as by the peasantry. Alix, however, had long been held to possess some uncanny power over the people of the supernatural world, for she would venture fearlessly into the most unholy spots, emerging unharmed and undisturbed, nor could any one ever learn from her whether or not she had actually held intercourse with the creatures whom they devoutly believed in, and so devoutly dreaded. Today, certainly, there was no suggestion of the uncanny about her as she lay upon her ledge of rock, looking off upon the sparkling waters that danced up to the very edge of her retreat. With one hand she shaded her eyes from the golden glare, and her head was pillowed on her other arm. Her usually smooth brow was puckered into a frown, for which the sun was not responsible, nor yet was Alix's mind upon any subject that might be supposed to anger or distress her. For the moment, she had dropped her inward debate, and was lazily watching the sea. The warmth of the afternoon had made her drowsy, and now the shadowy coolness of the cave soothed her till her vivid mental images had become a little blurred, 
and the sparkle of the water and its crispy rustle, as it advanced and retreated over the sand outside, was luring her mind into the fairy wastes of dreamland. She wondered a little whether she were awake or asleep, but, in point of fact, her eyes were not actually shut when a slender figure came round a corner of the entrance and slipped lightly into the cave. Alix started and sat up straight, while a high tenor voice cried out, Ho, Mistress Alix, tis thou then? Is't I that discovered thee in thy retreat, or thou that hast invaded mine? Oh, hey, David, thou startled me. Meseemeth I all but slept. Tis a day for sleep, but this is not the place. Is there room there on the ledge? Wilt let me up? Tis wet enough below here. Yeah, thy feet slop i' the sand, and thou'st frightened two crabs. Canst climb hither? He laughed merrily and scrambled up beside her, his light body seeming but a feather in weight. She made room beside her, and he sat down there, cocking one party-coloured knee upon the other, and beginning lightly. Thus bravely, then, thou comest into the cave of the water-goblin. Art thou, perchance, courted here by some sly water-sprite? The maiden, responding to his mood, laughed also. Not unless thou'lt plate the sprite, Master David. Say, wilt court me? Nay, sister. Thou and I, and all i' the castle up above, know each other in a way that admits no love foolery. Hi ho. The little man's tone had changed to one of whimsical earnestness. Alix made no immediate reply to his speech, and so, to entertain himself, he took from his open bag two pebbles, and began to toss them lightly into the air, one after the other. For a few seconds, Alix watched him absently. Then she said, Those pebbles, David, are like thee and me. Watch now, which will be the first to fall from thy hand. Thou art the mottled, I the grey. And I, damsel, said he, as he began to handle them a little less carelessly, I who sit here forever, for my amusement tossing into the air two light souls, catching them when they come back to me, and flinging them again away, who am I, I ask? Thou, David? Alix's face took on a little bitter smile. Why, thou art that inexorable thing that men call God. Wilt never drop thy stones from their wearisome sphere, almighty one? They will not fall. They return to me evermore, he answered, and, after another toss or two, he let them both remain in his hand while he looked at them for a moment. After that he put them back into his bag again, with a curious smile. That, then, is our end, he remarked at last. Is it our end? David, David, shall I not leave Le Crepuscule to fare forth into the world? I dream and dream, and vow unto myself that I shall surely go, and then I still remain. Ay, there are things that keep thee here, and me too. There's the baby now, and its angel-faced mother. And then madame, how is one to leave her when she is a little more alive than formerly? I too, Alix, have dreamed dreams. The fever of my boyhood, with its wanderings, its life, its continual change, comes upon me strong sometimes. Here in this place my wit lies buried. My soul grows grey within me, my eyes have forgot the look of the world's bright colours, and yet I stay on, I stay on for ever. How have we two went out together, David, thou and I? Think you the world might hold a place for us? I would be a good comrade, I promise thee. I would march stoutly at thy side, nor complain when weariness overcame me. We should not have always to beg for food, for I have a little bag. See Alix's look. There below, on the sand, by that sharp-pointed stone, there is a grey-white crab, he must be hurt. See how he fumbles and struggles without avail to reach the little pool ten inches from him? Watch him. He makes no progress. Now that were thou and I, thrown upon the world. Oh, this place is full of omens. I have found them here before. Tis the witchery of the cave. Alix failed to smile. This last augury, though it confirmed the one that she herself had made, did not please her. She sat silent on the ledge, her feet hanging her elbows on her knees, her head on her hand, watching intently all the little dramas taking place below her among the sea creatures. Nor was David in a mood to make conversation. So the two of them sat silent for a long time. How long a time neither of them knew. The water was growing more brightly golden under the beams of the fast-descending sun, and Alix noted the fact, but held her peace. It was David who, after a little while, suddenly exclaimed, Diable, Alix, see how the tide hath risen! We shall be wet enough getting out and back to the upper cliff. Come quickly. As he spoke, he slid from the ledge, landing in water that was up to his ankles. Quickly, Alix, I will steady thee. Come, thou'lt but be the wetter if thou stayest. 
Alec sat motionless upon the ledge above, and looked calmly down upon the dwarf. Reflect, David, how easy it were not to wet my ankles thus, how easy it would be just to sit here, until the stone should drop for the last time into the hand of God. David stood looking up at her, wide-eyed. The idea was slow to pierce his brain. Why, yes, said he, t'were easy enow, easy enow. Yet when I go, it must be from mine own room, and by a clean dagger stroke. I care not to choke myself to death in a goblin's cave. Come, Alix, the water riseth. Go thou on, David. I can come down when I will, for I have traversed the way often. Come down. Nay, David, come down. Nay. The water was deeper by four inches than it had been when he first reached the bottom of the cave. The dwarf looked up at the girl, who sat smiling at him, and his face reddened slightly. Then, without more ado, he climbed back upon the ledge and sat down beside Alix, hanging his dripping feet toward the water, which now covered the tallest of the stones on the floor of the cave. David, thou must go. Climb down and save thyself quickly. Thy slender body cannot much longer breast the tide. David crossed his knees and clasped his hands around them. If thou stayest, I also will remain. I beg of thee, go, ere it is too late. Not without thee. In the name of God I ask it. We two were together in God's hand. Then so be it, David. Sit thou here beside me. We will wait together. The little man did not reply to her this time, and Alix felt no more need for speech. They sat there, occupied with their own thoughts, both watching, under the spell of a peculiar fascination, how the green water was mounting, mounting toward them. The cave was filled with blinding light from the setting sun. The roar of the ocean, a voice mighty and ineffable, filled all their consciousness. White-crested breakers rolled in and broke below them, and their faces were wet with chill salt spray. The water in the cave was waist-deep. Alix was growing cold. A deadly intoxication stole upon her senses, and she bent far over the ledge to look into the swirling, foamy green below her. "'By the Almighty God, his creation is wondrous. This is a scene worthy of the end,' cried David, suddenly, in a hoarse, emotional tone. Alix started violently. The sound of a human voice— breaking in upon the universal murmur of the infinite waters, sent a sudden staff to her heart. In a quick flash, she beheld Lenore's baby holding out its feeble hands to her. Near it stood Lor, the penitent, and, on the other hand, Madame, with her great, grave, sorrowful eyes fixed full upon herself, Alix. David, cried the girl, suddenly, wildly, above the roar of the tide. David, we must escape! Quickly, quickly, quickly! As she spoke, she left the ledge to find herself swaying almost shoulder-deep in the fierce, swelling water. Come, she cried, her face livid with her newborn terror. For an instant, David looked down upon her with something resembling a smile. Then he followed her, and would have been carried off his feet in the water had not Alix steadied him with one hand, while, with the other, she clung to the rock above her head. The sudden chill woke David's senses, and he said sharply, We must hurry, Alix. There is no time to lose. Then the two of them began their work of getting out of the cave. David, with his small, leaf body clad in tight-fitting hosen and jerkin, started to swim lightly through the water, diving head foremost into the beating breakers, and rounding toward the shore with rather a sense of pleasurable skill than anything else. But with Alix, the case was different. Her long skirts were soaked with water and clung disastrously about her feet. The idea of her swimming was vain, and she grimly gave thanks for her height but she found that the matter of walking had its dangers too. The bottom of the cave and the outer stretch that lay between her and safety was very uneven. She stumbled over rocks and sank into sudden hollows, continually hampered by her clinging skirts. Presently she fell, and a great breaker came tumbling over her. In it she lost her self-control, and was presently rolling helpless in the tide, gasping in seawater with every terrified breath, and unable to get her limbs free from their binding, clinging robe. Alix was very near death in earnest, now, and she knew it. Presently, where a sweeping wave left her head for a moment above water, she sent one hoarse, guttural shriek toward David, who had regained the land, and he turned, horrified, to look at her. She heard his cry of amazement and distress, and then she was rolled upon her face, and knew nothing more till she found herself lying on the sand, with David bending over her, whiter than death, and trembling like a woman. She was dizzy and weak and sick, and her lungs ached furiously. Yet with it all, she saw David's distress, and managed to keep herself conscious by staring at him fixedly. "'Up, Alix, up,' he muttered. "'Thou must get up to the castle. 
I cannot carry thee there, and here thou'lt perish. Up, I say, here, hold to my belt. See, the water is upon us again. With an effort that seemed to her to be superhuman, Alix struggled to her feet. He held her dripping skirts away from her so that she could walk as little hampered as possible. And though she staggered and reeled at every step, they still made progress, and were halfway up the cliff before she collapsed again, utterly exhausted. Happily, at that moment, David spied the figure of Lore at the top of the cliff, and he cried to her with all the strength that was left him to come down. In a moment she was beside them, staring in silent astonishment at their plight. The demoiselle Alix had a fancy for bathing. She hath bathed, observed David. Alix did not speak, but suddenly her eyes met Lore's, and she burst into hysterical laughter. Lore, being a woman, realized that she was strained to the point of collapse, so she bade David go on before them and take all precautions to recover from his bath, and then, as soon as Alix signified her ability to go on again, Lore put one of her strong young arms about the dripping body, and sustaining more than half her weight, succeeded in getting her to the castle. Alix demurred faintly about going in, for she dreaded questions. But it was that hour of the day when the open rooms of the castle were deserted, when all the world was asleep or at play, and, as the two crossed the courtyard and went through the lower hall, they met no one but a pair of henchmen who were too respectful of Lore to voice their curiosity. As the young women went through the upper hall, on their way to Alix's room, there came, from behind Lenore's closed door, the gurgling crow of the baby. At this sound, Alix shuddered, and through her heart shot a pang of horrified remorse at the crime she had so nearly committed. A few moments later, the exhausted girl lay in her bed, wrapped round with blankets, her dripping garments stripped away, and her body glowing again with the warmth of vigorous friction, while her wet hair was fastened high on her head, away from her face. When Lore had removed, as far as possible, every evidence of the escapade, she bent for a moment over the pillow of her foster sister, and then stole quietly away. Alix made no sign at her departure. She lay back in the bed, her eyes closed, her face set like marble, her mind wandering vaguely over the events of the afternoon. Gradually, her world grew full of misty, creeping shadows, and she was on the borderland of sleep, when someone again bent over her, and the fragrant breath of hot wine came to her nostrils. With an effort, she shook her eyes open to find Laura's kindly face above her, and Laura's hand holding out to her a silver cup. Drink, Alix, twill give thee strength. Obediently, Alix drank, and the posset sent a new glow of warmth through her body. Now, if thou canst, thou must sleep. Alix sent a thoughtful glance into her companion's eyes, and there was something in her look that caused Lore to take both of the trembling hands in her own, and to wait for Alix to speak. Nay, Lore, nay, I cannot sleep till I have told thee. Someone I must tell. Someone that will understand. Let me confess to thee. Lore seated herself on the edge of the bed, Alix still retaining her hands, and Laura's sad eyes looked down upon the drawn face of her foster sister while she spoke. Alix, she said softly, methinks I know thy confession. Thou hast tried to leave Le Crepuscule, is it not so? Alix's eyes suddenly filled with tears. It is so. I tried to leave Le Crepuscule. The last she only whispered faintly. But it drew thee back again. The castle would not loose its hold on thee. Even so was it with me. I thought I hated it, Alix, with its loneliness and its shadows and its vast silences. Yet however far away I was, I found it always before my eyes, or hidden in my thoughts. Through my hours of highest happiness I yearned for it, and it drew me back to it at last. It is true, it is true, I know thou speakest truth. And thou wilt not try again to go away, my sister? Not again, oh, not again. I go to you all, you and Madame and Madame Lenore, and your eyes called me back. It is my home, is not? I have a place here, have I not? Ah, Lore, thou'st been so good to me. Shall we not, thou and I, go back again into our childhood, and dream of naught better than dwelling here forever in this place? Both of us have sinned, and now we are come home into the shadow of the Castle of Twilight, for forgiveness' sake. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Castle of Twilight」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shreya The Castle of Twilight 
by Margaret Horton Potter, Chapter Sixteen, The Middle of the Valley. Alex had faith enough in David to believe that he would keep silent about the affair of that afternoon, and her confidence was not misplaced. No one save Laura knew of the caprice and the projected sin that had led them into their dangerous plight, and to the dwarf's credit. Be it said that he never attached any blame to Alex for their adventure. Indeed, thereafter his manner towards her was marked by unusual consideration, a little wild interest and sympathy, sprung from a knowledge that their habits of mind had led them both in the same ways of thought and desire. During the remainder of the summer, however, neither of them ventured again into the goblin's cave, and from Alex's mind at least. Every thought, every desire to leave the castle had been washed away. Her dreams of another life were dead, and as the golden days slipped by, the thought that Le Crepuscule must be her home forever came to have no bitterness in it, for she had learned in a strange way how Le Crepuscule was rooted into her heart, and how impossible it would be that she should leave it till the great inevitable. Should bid her say farewell. Indeed, the castle had set its seal upon every one of its inmates. The little household had acquired the peculiar characteristics that generally grow up in a secluded community. Every dweller in the twilight land was unconsciously possessed of the same quiet manner, the same air of tranquil repose, the same habit of abstracted thought, and these things had stolen upon them so unawares. That none was conscious of it in any other, and least of all in herself. It was a singularly beautiful atmosphere in which to bring up a little being fresh to the world. In this place, a new soul might have dwelt forever untainted by any mark of worldliness, of passion, or of sin, for these things were foreign to the whole place. No one in the castle but had, at some time, been through the depths of human. Experience, been swayed by the most powerful emotions, and known the passion that is inherent in every mortal, but from these things the twilight folk had been purified by long stretches of vain longing, vain struggles in the midst of solitude, and that continued repression that alone can eradicate mortal tendencies towards sin. And now the women of this castle had reached, in their progress, the neutral. Veil of tranquillity that lies between the gorgeous meadows of delight and the grim crags of grief and disappointment. There was no one in the castle that did not at times reflect upon these things. But of them all, Eleanor saw most clearly whence they had all come and where they now were, whither they might be going. Ah, that, that, who should say? But she could see and understand the quiet happiness. That Lenore had reached through her child, and the increasing contentment that was more than resignation in Lore, and if she was ignorant of the route by which Courtois, Alex, and David had come to the kingdom of tranquillity, at least she knew that all had reached it, and was glad that it was so. To Saint Nazaire, who was now her only connection with the outer world, she talked of all these things, and found in him not quite the spirit of her castle. But yet a great understanding of human and spiritual matters. Summer wove out its web over the castle by the sea, and at length its golden heat began to give way before the attacks of chilly nights and shortening days. The earth grew rich and red with autumn. Chestnut fires began to blaze upon peasants' hearts, and the early morning air had in it that little sting that brings the blood to the cheek and fire to the eye. It was still too early for flights of storks toward the Nile, and the year, hovering on the edge of dissolution, was at the zenith of its glory. It was a time when the smoke from the forest fires lingered pungently over the land for days on end, like incense offered to the beauty of Mother Earth. It was the time when the sun rises and sets in a veil of mist that transcends the splendor of its golden gleams, till. Before the incomparable richness and purity of its glory, the human spectator can only stand back, aghast and trembling with awe. 
In fine, it was that time when, nature having reached the full measure of her maturity, she was turning to look back upon her youth, in retrospect of all the loveliness that had been hers, before she should start toward the darker, colder, grayer regions that lay about her coming grave. It was late in the afternoon of such an autumn day as the three women of Lepgurpha School, Lore, Lenore, and Eleanor, each lightly wrapped about to protect her from the slight chill in the air, went out of the castle to the terrace bordering the cliff for their evening walk. In the hearts of all three lay that little wistful sadness that was part of the time of year, and in their surrounding solitude they involuntarily drew close to each other. Yet their faces were not wholly sad. None of them wept at the thought of the long winter that was again upon them. Hand in hand, by the murmurous sea, they walked, looking off upon the broad plain of moving waters, each unconsciously seeking to read there the destiny of her remaining years. The hour was a holy one, and there came no sound from the living world to pierce its stillness. Nature knelt before the great marriage of the sun and sea. The altar of the west was hung with golden and purple tapestries, and the ministers of the sky poured out a libation of crimson flowing wine before the Lord of heaven. And when the sacrifice was made, all could behold how the great sun slipped gently from his car into the embers of the sea, and the two of them were presently hidden underneath the golden locks and shimmering veil of the beautiful bride, and thereafter twilight, the swift-footed handmaid, hated by all the ocean nymphs, quickly pulled the broad curtains of gray and crimson across the portals of the bridal room. The sweet dusk deepened, but it was not yet time for the rising of the moon. There was still a flush of red in the west, and still the breasts of the gulls that veered over the waters flashed white and luminous in the gathering gray. The silence was absolute, save for the silken swish of the tide rising gently along the shore. The spell of twilight, the great soul twilight of the Middle Ages, hung heavy on the battlements of the castle on the cliff. On the terrace, the three women paused in their slow walk. Lenore, her white face uplifted, and a look in her face as if the gates of heaven had opened a little before her eyes, said dreamily, How sweet it is, and how beautiful, our home. The silence of the others throbbed assent to her whispered words. The ghouls were sinking slowly toward their nests. The drawbridge over the moat was just lifting for the night. A lapwing or two floated round the high turrets of the castle, and from the doorway there, Alex was coming forth, bearing Renora's baby in her arms. The stillness grew more intense, and over the edge of the eastern trees slipped the round, pink harvest moon. Then... One by one, a few great stars came sparkling out into the sky. See, murmured Eleanor very softly, the east is clear around the rising moon. And Laura replied to her, yes, very clear. How beautiful will be the morrow's dawn. End of the Castle of Twilight by Margaret Horton Potter